Greetings everyone and welcome to chapter 14 on the brain and cranial nerves. So the first part of the lecture we're going to go over the generalities of the brain and we're going to talk about the six major regions. We have the cerebrum which is the major part of the brain which is the seat of higher intelligence and it's where all of our long-term planning and processing and a lot of the major heavy work of thinking is done and conscious perception is done. We have the cerebellum, which is important for motor movements, learning motor movements, and coordinating motor movements. We have the diencephalon, which consists of a thalamus, a hypothalamus, and a roof of the diencephalon called the epithalamus. And these are sort of in the central part of the brain. And there, uh, in, within the diencephalon, we have a major relay station bringing information, or I should say receiving information from the periphery and then filtering it out and sending the important and relevant information to the cerebrum where it can then be further processed and brought to conscious attention. We have the midbrain and we have something called the pons and the medulla oblongata. And these, the midbrain pons and medulla oblongata taken together are called the brainstem. And as the name implies, these sort of resemble a stalk or a stem that comes down from the diencephalon. All right, so we have, within the brain, we have somewhat of a bit of symmetry. So if we look at the cerebrum, this would be the cerebrum here, you have a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere. The same is true for the cerebellum, which would be this structure. And even within the thalamus, we have a left and right thalamus. And even when we look at some of the groupings of parts of the midbrain, we'll see they're definitely left and right segments. So the brain has a natural symmetry in structure. However, there are certain lateralizations so that certain hemispheres within the cerebrum, at least, may specialize for certain things. And we'll get to that when we get move on later in the lecture. All right, so here we have the cerebrum. That would be this pink part right here. The cerebellum is the blue part right here with these folds in it called folia. And then if you could look through the cerebrum and see inside, you could see the diencephalon. And then this green part here is the midbrain. And remember this cerebrum has been made somewhat transparent so you could see the positions of those things that would otherwise be covered. This blue part here is the pons. And then this sort of reddish pink thing here is the medulla oblongata. And below that, we have the spinal cord. You'll notice these folds within the brain. You'll notice these convexities. This is all gray matter, and this is what we call cortex. And the convexities are arranged in these gyri, or they are these gyri, where you have gray matter. And the gray matter will be anywhere from one to five millimeters thick. And this is what we call the cortex of the brain. And it has these convex shapes that are interdigitated by these sulci, or these indentions here. So sulci are sort of shallow indentions, and some of the deeper indentions would be called fissures, although the name of this particular one is actually called the central sulcus. And this would be the lateral sulcus, also known as the lateral fissure. And then we'll see some other major landmarks on the brain as we look at it in more detail. All right, so the diencephalon, as we said, is basically, it's located in this area right here, if you could look through the brain, and this is just a generality, this isn't actually the shape of it, but somewhat similar to that. And it has the left thalamus and the right thalamus. It has an area called the hypothalamus, which is very important, especially in hormonal control. As we'll see, it's a major part of the endocrine system as well. And we also have something called the epithalamus, which has a little gland called the pineal gland. And the pineal gland secretes a hormone called melatonin, which is important for regulating sleep and wake cycles, so what we call circadian rhythms. And that is the natural tendency to get up when the sun comes up and to go to bed when it gets dark at night. It also has some implication in reproductive function as the days get longer in the springtime and then get shorter in the winter time. You have varying cyclic changes in reproductive function as well. All right, then below the diencephalon, we have something, well, as part of the diencephalon, we have the hypothalamus, 
And the hypothalamus makes a lot of hormones and controls another gland called the pituitary gland. And I should say the hypothalamus is a brain area and the pituitary gland is a gland that makes hormones. So hypothalamus controls not only hormone production of the pituitary gland, but also makes hormones. And we will see a lot more of the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland when we get to the chapters on the endocrine system. It's also important in regulation of emotions and has a lot of autonomic functions as well. So these are things that are under automatic control that we don't think about. We have the pituitary gland, which is a little, basically a gland that secretes hormones and it sits within the cella turcica of the sphenoid bone. So if you remember that saddle shape within the sphenoid bone, the purpose of it is to hold the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland is attached to the hypothalamus by, by way of a funnel-shaped stalk called the infundibulum. And the infundibulum literally means a funnel. And so this is a very important area because the hypothalamus is part of the brain. And this pituitary gland is basically has neurons from the hypothalamus in it and receives lots of commands, both hormonal and neuronal. In fact, it has neurons descending from the hypothalamus into the posterior part of the pituitary gland. And the hypothalamus will produce neurons that are then released from the posterior part of the pituitary gland. And as I say, that is a set. That is a subject for a different lecture. But at any rate, it's a very important interface between ner nervous and endocrine systems. Then we have the brainstem. And the brainstem has three major sections, or three sections, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. And the midbrain, we'll see, has several functions. The pons is important in somatic and visceral motor control. And the medulla oblongata has a variety of functions, not the least of which is to regulate your breathing, rhythmicity, your heart rate, your force of contraction of your heart, and also your vasomotor tone, that is dilation and contraction of your blood vessels. And so you also have some interaction with the medulla and the pons, where the, you also have some breathing centers or nuclei in the pons that work with the breathing centers within the medulla oblongata to change some of or modify some of the patterns of breathing. All right, so the midbrain is also called the mesencephalon because in development, it actually is the middle part of the brain and these brain vesicles that derive from a structure, an embryonic structure called the neural tube. And the midbrain is the only one that really stays more or less in the same place as it develops. The other vesicles go on to divide and become give rise to other parts of the brain. But the midbrain is very important for processing sight sound and certain reflexes. So we have a group of nuclei in the midbrain called the corpora quadrigemini, and these sit on the roof of the midbrain. And the roof is also called the tectum, from the Latin word for roof. And then you also have what's called the tegmentum, which means floor. And we'll see that the floor of the midbrain has a very specialized set of neurons called the substantia nigra that produce dopamine. And dopamine is very important in regulating function of other areas in the brain involved in movement. And if you have a destruction of the substantia nigra, you will actually induce Parkinson's disease. Throughout the midbrain pons and medulla oblongata, you have this loosely organized mass of, of white matter and gray matter that's collectively called the reticular formation. And the reticular formation is involved in processing of uh, emotion, awareness, autonomic function, but most importantly, it's going to regulate your state of awareness. So whether you're drowsy or sleepy or whether you're wide awake and you're ready to face a threat or some task that you're focused on, your state of awareness is going to be highly regulated by this structure called the reticular formation. And more specifically, it has its headquarters in the midbrain in an area called the reticular activating system. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in later segments. So here we have sort of just the general overview. 
uh, first the diencephalon up here, and this would be the thalamus. And you can only see one half of it here. And then we would have the midbrain is this green part. On the back here, you can see this corpora quadrigemini and the tectum. And we have what we call the superior colliculus and the inferior colliculus. And the superior colliculus, colliculus means little hill. And indeed, it looks like a little bump here. And this inferior colliculus looks like a little bump. And together, there's a left and right superior colliculus and a left and right inferior colliculus. So these pair of colliculi collectively are known as the corpora quadrigemini, or the body of four. So you have in the superior colliculus, you're receiving information from visual input from the eyes. And a lot of the output of the superior colliculus is going to be involved in subconscious control of visual reflexes. So if you see a bright light, you're probably worrying it to it, even before you realize it, because you're going to process the information in the superior colliculus before it reaches your cerebrum or an area where you become consciously aware of it. And the inferior colliculus is a similar structure, but it does the same thing for auditory inputs. So if you hear a loud sound or if you heard a gunshot go off, your brain or I should say your brain stem is going to want to orient you to that threat as soon as possible so that you can assess what it is. So you probably turn your head toward it very quickly. You'll see this section right here. These are white matter tracts that are bringing information or a white matter tract bringing information from the periphery to the cerebrum and also sending inputs from the cerebrum to the periphery. And this is called a little foot. This is what we call the cerebral peduncle. And it's one of the major landmarks and structures of the, mid, of the midbrain. If we look below that, we have the pons. And you'll notice the pons has these crossing fibers. These are called transverse pontine fibers. And they are linked directly to the cerebellum, which is behind this thing. Then here we have our medulla oblongata. And this is very important for bringing information from the periphery and I'll eventually send it up to the thalamus and also several tracts bringing motor commands down will also pass through the medulla oblongata. In addition to that, you have several nuclei, some of which we've already discussed, that are going to be autonomic nuclei for breathing, for heart rate, for even the digestive system and also for vasomotor tone, that is the constriction or dilation of your blood vessels, which will regulate blood pressure. All right, within the brain, we talked about the fact that we have fluid-filled spaces, and the fluid-filled spaces within the brain are called ventricles. And if you were to be able to see straight through the brain, and this is the lateral view, this is what the ventricles would look like. You would see the lateral ventricles on either side, and these both connect to this center structure called the third ventricle, and it is between the two halves of the thalamus, so it's between the left and right thalamus. And so it's very thin if you look at it in, um, uh, from the front, if you look at it from the anterior view. Then we have this connecting structure here called the cerebral aqueduct that leads into the fourth ventricle. And the fourth ventricle is really right posterior to the pons and to the spinal cord. It's, it's posterior to the pons, the medulla oblongata, and, sorry about that, and then eventually leads into the central canal of the spinal cord and is continuous with it. Now within these Cerebral ventricles, um, these ventricles, I should say, we have these areas that produce cerebrospinal fluid. I want to go back to that. You will find that in the roof of the third ventricle and in the roof of the fourth ventricle, as well as in the floor of the lateral ventricles, we have the specialized tissue called the choroid plexus that makes the cerebrospinal fluid. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. First, we'll talk a little bit more in general about the protective systems that protect the brain, since it's a very delicate organ. And if you were to damage to the brain, you would do damage to your ability to survive.
So obviously the bones of the cranium are very important for this. And the, beneath the bones of the cranium, you have this coverings called the meninges. And you've probably all heard of meningitis. You can have cranial meningitis or you can have spinal meningitis, but this is an inflammation of these tissues. And these tissues are really in three layers. And the cerebrospinal fluid circulates from the ventricles through the central canal, and they percolate out of some openings here in the fourth ventricle. You have three openings that will then allow the cerebrospinal fluid to flow into one of the layers of these cranial meninges, and the cranial meninges are continuous with a second set of meninges that we already discussed called the spinal meninges. And basically it's one continuous set of meninges. Just the cranial meninges cover the brain and the spinal meninges cover the spinal cord. And they have one other physical barrier that protects the brain and that is the blood brain barrier that we talked about a little bit earlier. And this is the endothelial cells of the capillaries and blood vessels within the brain. They form very close tight junctions to prevent things from getting through in circulation that might otherwise get to other areas of the body, but prevent certain chemicals from getting through from circulation into the interstitial fluid in the brain where it might damage things. For example, if you take the example of monosodium glutamate, and it's a typical flavor enhancer that's used in foods, or also say aspartame, which is a sweetener, an artificial sweetener made of aspartate and glutamate. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. And if you get too much of it, it can become neurotoxic because it could overexcite neurons. So if you ingest monosodium glutamate or aspartame, you don't want that aspartate and glutamate crossing the blood-brain barrier and getting into the interstitial fluid of the brain because there it might do some damage and it might overexcite the neurons of the brain. So the blood-brain barrier is basically a tighter filtering of things that can get from the blood into the brain and the surrounding tissues. So the blood-brain barrier is maintained by the astrocytes. When we looked at the glial cells, we saw that astrocytes have those astrocytic end feet that surround the blood-brain barrier. And this really basically controls the permeability of those endothelial cells in the capillaries. All right, so when we go back to the meninges for a little bit, we have three layers. We have the outermost layer, which is called the dura mater, which literally means tough mother. And it's a very thick layer that is fused to the periosteum of the bone that overlies it. Between the dura mater and a really thin layer that overlies directly the surface of the brain and even follows the sulci and the gyri, we have this innermost layer called the pia mater, which means delicate. Pia is delicate. And then we have this ar arachnoid mater in between. And it's named arachnoid mater because if you look at it, it looks like spider webs. And the arachnoid mater is where the cerebrospinal fluid circulates. And these are very important because they create, along with the ventricles, they create this fluid-filled space in which the brain and the spinal cord are suspended. And so not only does it take sort of the physical weight of pressure, or I should say the physical weight off the brain, it makes it as though it's several pounds less. So it reduces the weight of the brain, if you will, and makes it more suspended within this protective fluid medium and also prevents shock from the brain hitting the skull, the side of the skull or something like that. So one of the biggest problems that people have is brain trauma, and this can cause permanent damage, and this is a big topic among people who play contact sports such as martial arts or hockey or football, and they get repeated head traumas, and they end up doing damage over time because if you hit the head hard enough, the brain is inside your skull, and if you hit it hard enough, it'll hit the side, it'll hit the skull, it'll hit the interior of the skull, and that creates trauma to the brain. It's like if somebody hits you in the face, but just imagine that if you, let's just say somebody hit your car from behind, and you went forward, 
your brain hits the front part of your skull, then bounces back, hits the back part of your skull, and your brain then bounces forward and hits the front part of your skull again from the inside. Well, this is exactly what the cranial meninges are there to ameliorate. So it does attenuate that impact quite a bit, but you can still overpower the cranial meninges ability to protect the brain, and you can cause concussions and other problems that if, depending on the severity, can lead to certainly sequelae and symptoms, but can also lead to permanent brain injury. All right, so here's sort of the overview of what they look like. Here is our dura mater, and you'll notice it has this periosteal layer here that is flush against the skull, or the periosteum of the bones of the skull. And then you have this meningeal layer, which is right flush against the subarachnoid space. Now, in the book, they show you the subdural space here, and typically, most people do not have an epidural or a subdural space. The only time you would have a subdural space is in the case of dehydration, trauma, or other problems. You will find the subdural space in cadavers, but not typically in living people unless there's been some kind of trauma or pathology or injury. Now you will notice the arachnoid is all of this spider web looking thing, and this is called the arachnoid trabeculi. And trabeculi, you probably remember, is a term we saw in spongy bone as well, with these similar sort of lattice work of tissue in here. And then all throughout that, we have the subarachnoid space, and this is where the cerebrospinal fluid circulates. Right under that, we have the pia mater, and the pia really does follow all these sulci and gyri down into, it really follows the surface of the brain. The other thing you need to know is that on occasion, you could have a head trauma in which an artery or a vein breaks and leaks into and creates a subdural space. That would be a subdural hematoma, and that can cause pressure to push in on the brain underlying that area. You can also have more rarely, but it does happen, something called an epidural hematoma in which blood manages to get in and create a space between the periosteal layer of the dura and the overlying bone. You'll notice that in this particular picture, we have this thing here called a dural sinus. In different parts of the brain, we'll see, especially on the mid-sagittal line, we'll see that there are sagittal sinuses, and these are basically venous drainage areas. So a lot of the venous supply, that is the blood supply that is returning from the brain, that has basically had the oxygen and nutrients consumed out of it, it's going to drain into these dural sinuses and then through the uh, internal jugular vein. All right, so the dural the dura mater itself will follow some of these major folds within the brain. And as you probably remember from lab, you have a very large, what we call longitudinal fissure that separates the two hemispheres into left and right hemispheres. And you have one dural fold that goes right down that transverse fissure. You also have a uh, fold of dura that separates the cerebellum from the cerebrum, and you also have a piece of dura mater that separates the two halves of the cerebellum. And so when you see this term falx, it means sickle-shaped. And if you look at it, it's kind of sickle-shaped, and hence the name. So the falx cerebri separates the two halves of the cere cerebrum. The tentorium cerebelli, that means, tentorium means tent, and it's basically a little roof that separates the cerebrum from the cerebellum. And then you have the falx cerebelli, which is a sickle-shaped piece of dura mater that separates the two hemispheres of the cerebellum. And so here they are. If you were to take the brain out of the cranial cavity, you would see that this is the falx cerebri. Here's the tentorium cerebelli. And here you have the falx cerebelli. You'll notice that you have these dural sinuses. Right along the midline, on the mid-sagittal superior part here, we have the superior sagittal sinus, which is made by this dura mater opening up from the periosteal space and the meningeal space. So this 
sinus is between the periosteal space and the meningeal space, or sorry, the meningeal layer. So the periosteal layer and the meningeal layer, the space between it is where these sinuses occur. So here you have your superior sagittal sinus, and right following above the corpus callosum, if you could see it here, you would see the uh, inferior sagittal sinus. And then, if you could see it, it's kind of hard to see here, you have one that follows the exterior, or I should say the posterior curvature horizontally of the skull, and that's the transverse sinus. And these are major venous drainage areas of the brain, and they will lead into the internal jugular vein. All right, so the cerebral spinal fluid itself is very important. We find it on all the uh, um, exposed surfaces of the central nervous system. That is the brain and the spinal cord. And basically, you have a lot of communication with the surrounding, the tissue surrounding the brain. So that is the interstitial fluid of the brain. A lot of times when we refer to tissues in an organ, we call it the parenchyma or parenchyma, parenchyma. These are the tissues, and this is where the interstitial fluid is found. And so the cerebrospinal fluid has a lot of interchange. With this tissue, it can remove, uh, sorry, the fluid within this tissue. It can remove wastes from this fluid. It can also, obviously, it has a protective effect, a cushioning effect. And it also is able to transport chemical messengers within there, get rid of waste products, and we'll see when we look at how it's made and how it's gotten rid of, we'll see that it's made in this thing called the choroid plexus that, that are in the ventricles, circulated through the ventricle central canal and the uh, meninges, and then it's extracted from these things called arachnoid granulations into these dural sinuses where the fluid is returned to venous flow, so back to the blood flow. And we'll find that the brain typically, or I should say the ventricles, the choroid plexi in the ventricles make about 500 milliliters of this stuff a day, but only about 150 is being circulated continuously. And so it has to be removed at a fairly high rate. So here's a picture. This is a representation of the choroid plexus. And here you can see capillaries and you can see you have exchange, you have fluid from the blood plasma that's going to be going into the production of CSF, though I should say there's quite a bit of difference, both ionically and in terms of proteins, between the composition of blood plasma and CSF, but the fluid of the plasma is used by these ependymal cells to produce the CSF, and at the same time, it can shuttle wastes out that were in the CSF and put them back into the blood plasma and to be circulated for disposal. So this is just sort of a picture of what goes on in a choroid plexus, and this would be in one of the ventricles. In this case, they've chosen the third ventricle here. And then here we see the whole schematic of how the meninges surround the brain and the spinal cord, and then you have the ventricles. This would be the lateral ventricle, and this would be the choroid plexus in the floor of the lateral ventricle. In the roof of the third ventricle, you see here choroid plexus, and you see choroid plexus in the roof of the fourth ventricle as well. And then you can see these lateral apertures, and then there's a median aperture through which the cerebrospinal fluid percolates out of the ventricles and, and into the meninges. And then it circulates through the meninges, and then you can see right over here we have these things called subarachnoid granulations, and these are basically areas in which the cerebrospinal fluid can be recirculated back into venous circulation. And so this is this, the cerebrospinal fluid that's been circulating for a little bit, and it's time to get rid of it. And so it's basically moved out of circulation in the meninges and the ventricles via these subarachnoid granulations or arachnoid granulations. They're technically arachnoid granulations. Sometimes you see the term arachnoid, arachnoid villi used. And then the cerebrospinal fluid will then be recirculated into venous circulation into the superior sagittal sinus. All right, so we'll stop there for this part and then we'll move on and start talking a little bit more
about the blood supply next time to the brain and also we'll talk about the various areas of the brain. So we'll start with each area of the brain from the medulla oblongata and work our way up to the cerebrum.